Oftentimes, the clients themselves can be their biggest leaks. They brag, they talk to their friends, they have one iTunes account that their entire family, including their spouse, uses, and when they send text messages, the text messages come up on their children's iPad, on their, on their spouse's iPad, and so on and so forth. So they're jeopardizing, maybe they're sending an email and that email that they send from their phone or their home computer is coming up on their spouse's iPad or tablet. It's something we see more often than not. Family offices, I found often um, don't have the required, well, what I would say, sufficient security policies in place to make sure the information stays adequately locked down. Um, People call up, they pretend, and we'll get to this a little bit later, so I'm just signposting a little bit, but people will pretend to you and call or send. How, how, who here has gotten an email from a friend asking for information? And it's a, it's a way to, phishing, uh, to fish information out. It's called actually spear phishing is the actual term. Um, so an, another thing we've seen, and, and so I had, had a recent case, and it was a very well-known couple, and they're very wealthy. And um, so they have elaborate security measures, and they both, both now in separation each have security teams, and their, tr their movements are being tracked, both husband and wife movements being tracked by their security teams, their children's movements being tracked by their security teams. This is all very elaborate. And so now they're going through a custody um, dispute. And one of the questions was whether mom was really drop, dropping off the child at, at school or having the security detail do it. And so they're getting into all this. And it's the, the problem is, is that, OK, there's some really good info there. We have the evidence of where everyone was. Um, but we want to reveal that the fact that they're being tracked, how they're being tracked, um, because again, we have other people looking at this who may mean them harm. That's why they have security. And um, we just have to be sensible about this. Is it worth it winning the custody case by also causing them harm? So it's just taking a step back rather than saying, wow, I got some gold here, let me use it. So it, here it's, we, we kind of talk offline about, okay, what information do we want to reveal or not reveal? If we have to reveal something, can we do it under seal? Can we close a courtroom? We're going to talk about techniques like that. Um, so there is a ton of information. These undisclosed facts, there's things that, that, are, that are unknown about a, about a party um, that we know about as their divorce lawyer because it's relevant to a custody case. And now it's sitting in our file. We're targets. Um, and, and I know I had one particularly high profile case that I was concerned that not only the press, but there was this other religious entity that might be um, interested in, in, in my file. And so it's, we, we, we are, I mean, if somebody unlocked your file, there, there is a tremendous amount of information in there. So we're a target for getting that. And it would, it would just be ruinous to us if that information were taken from our file and publicized. So we're gonna talk about ways to really, really lock that down. And also, think about all these, for example, the security detail. You take a deposition of this person in the security detail, anybody can call a court reporter and order a copy of a deposition transcript. So I think we'll talk more about this later, but we wanna make sure we properly make sure those transcripts are confidential. So the, the physical security risks, I think, to a high-profile client are pretty, pretty obvious. And just to thinking about ways that, that a client could be harmed by the information we put in our papers is the purpose of that slide. Um, we talked about ways of what leaving information out. Um, the, the also, we have financial information. We can hit the next one. Um, financial information in an income and expense declaration is very, very detailed. How much of that do we want to put in? Material non-public information. So I've been dealing with this in cases involving officers, directors of publicly traded companies or soon to be publicly traded companies. So here are these, these people know facts uh, that are, that are non-public. 
um, that would bear greatly on the value of this stock and also have to be revealed in a divorce case. So we have a disclosure obligation. We're going to have to say, well, hey, there's an opportunity coming up or there's an event that's happening that's going to make the stock go up or go down. We may have to disclose that uh, to fulfill our, our fiduciary duty uh, in the case, but then that would violate uh, SEC rules by divulging it. And so we do, we do have a, um, a statute on that. It's 11, 1100, 1101 that says that we don't have to disclose something if it would be a violation of law to disclose it. Um, so there, there's, there's some case law around it. Um, but my point is, is that we have to be super, super careful if we're in possession of that information. If we end up and this is my fear, and I've talked to people in my office about not uh, le avoiding the temptation of trading on it. Because as we're, we're representing somebody who, say, is involved in a publicly traded company, and they tell us, like, hey, you know what, uh, here's what's happening. There's a big event that's going to happen. The stock price is going to move probably here. Do we have to disclose it, Tony? Well, we talk about it. Meanwhile, somebody in our office is saying, ooh. I'm going to go buy some Apple stock. And now we'd have a huge problem. Not just that, that person in the office that would be potentially criminal um, liability, but the, but the firm itself would be responsible. Because if we don't take adequate precautions to prevent trading on, on material non-public information, we can be responsible. So I've created a policy in my office um, about, um, you know, that no one can trade on this. No one can have a, a stock account in, in one of my clients' companies. And, and when and this type of information is revealed in a meeting, I'm going to remind them saying, don't go out, don't trade, it's not worth it. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's a big, big old temptation. And there's some people, I think all of us would know we can't do that as lawyers, but as our secretary or as our paralegal going to know that probably not. So, um, and anyway, I'm trying to save, save people some problems. Um, this is <clears throat> fairly straightforward. The next slide, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Redact the sensitive information. I mean, if it's if it's there and you you don't want it known, don't don't put it in the record. Um, you can try to file something under seal. The court balances transparency versus privacy. You need to have a pretty good reason to be able to file under seal. Uh, the the rule is two five five zero, the California rule of court. But um, sometimes. The, Sometimes the court will file something under seal or just allow you to lodge it if there's a compelling reason, and it's the least restrictive means of keeping that information confidential. And it's hard to go through that rule if you've looked at it or worked with it before. It's a very, very narrow path. And um, so, I don't know, LA is pretty lax, but I've had other, other you know, counties where we file things under seal and then it'll be accepted under seal, and then all of a sudden we'll see a minute order coming out saying no. We, we've denied it, go, go ahead and file it publicly. So we have to be very, very careful um, in what we're doing. And so in what we can, in some, in some situations with, well, we're going to talk about temporary judges um, and arbitrations to try and avoid that because the redaction sounds great in, in concept, but because of the First Amendment public access issues, if, if somebody challenges it or the court clerk or court staff is really looking out, we're not going to be able to redact or conditionally seal many things. And it's a balancing act because you have your freedom of the press, but you also have a right to privacy in the California Constitution. So, so obviously we can have protective orders, but what good are those if somebody violates it and they have nothing to lose? Um, so this penalty clause um, would be looked at. If So if we have a settlement agreement with someone um, exiting a relationship, and there's a promise to keep things quiet, um, what I would recommend is a back-end payment after a period of time, maybe a period of years, to say, if you were quiet, if you've, if you've followed the agreement, then you get this final payment. That was done in, in um, Mel Gibson's case, which is probably like MG versus somebody. Uh, but um, he, he, had a, he had that situation, and he had a, he had a settlement agreement 
that said, don't, don't say anything. And the other side went on Howard Stern and said something which, which he believed was in violation of the order and of the agreement. And he said, you're not getting the final payment. She challenged it, it went to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal affirmed that said, you broke the agreement, you'd lose the right to this money. And um, she even raised a First Amendment type argument saying, well, I have a right to speak and how can I be punished for speaking? And I think it's almost in a footnote in the decision says, yes, there's a First Amendment, but you can waive it. So you can waive your First Amendment rights. And so that's a good, good roadmap there for how we can create a transaction to say, hey, there's a promise to not disclose these facts and there'll be a payment, but the payment will be conditioned on you complying with it and it'll come at the end. And if you violate it, it it's, it's an enforceable agreement. 